Welcome to our webinar. We're going to give it just a few minutes for people to get it signed on. Um, but if you're already here, you can see down at the bottom, you've got some controls uh, that you can work with. And so if you are already on, if you can click in, you may need to go to the more section and say, uh, click on chat. And we'd love to have you let us know that you're here. So if you just say hello and uh, we'll be able to see who you are and tell us where you're, who you're from, what company you're with, or what part of the country you're from. So um, we're glad you're here. Hey, Annette. Hey, Matt. Hey, Grayson. Hey, Kristen. Uh, lots of my friends here. I'm glad to see you on. Um, Deborah, Sharon, Kevin, we're still adding people. We're going to go just another minute. Melissa, Vicki, Scott, so glad you guys are all here. Um, Juan, I'm not sure I butchered that right. Sorry about that. And uh, Carlita, so we are just so delighted you are here. We want to honor your time. We're going to go about one minute. I'm going to go ahead and start with some introductions and some housekeeping, and then we'll jump right into it. So the first, oh, one, so the, so let me actually tell you one that piece of housekeeping I'm actually going to start with is you've got all of the presenters on the right hand side. And you've got options to be able to shrink us and move us around. So most of you probably know who I am. I'm Steve Moran. I'm the founder of Senior Housing Forum. We're hosting this uh, webinar today. Uh, I'm going to let Mike and Rebecca and Kim each introduce themselves as they are on the slide. So Mike, why don't we start with you? Hey, everybody. My name is Mike Heisey. I'm a senior product manager at CareMerge. Uh, I have over eight years of product management experience in the nutrition, fitness, and healthcare industry, and I look forward to talking with everyone today. Cool. Thanks, Mike. Rebecca? Well, good day, all. My name is Rebecca Edelman. I have a law firm in the Mid-South. Uh, I reside in Memphis, Tennessee. I've been in senior housing, doing litigation defense for senior housing, and regulatory and other work in the uh, in the space for nearly 30 years, and very happy to be here and be hosted by um, by y'all, and look forward to discussing uh, expectations management. Cool. And last but and best, Kim. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. I'm Kim Mee, Director of Engagement for Gardens Management Solutions, and I am speaking with about 29 years of recreation and long-term care experience. And I've spent the last two and a half with Gardens Management Solutions. We have um, about 17 and a half years of industry acclaimed operational history in developing and consulting for senior living, assisted living, and memory care communities. Um, and our portfolio includes 60 communities within seven states. Cool. Thank you very much. So that takes care of that. We're going to do a little bit of housekeeping. We'll move to trends and technology, uh, expectation management relative to families and residents, and then best practices, uh, question and answer, and then we'll do a quick wrap up. Um, so we are recording the webinar and a link to that recording will be emailed out to you uh, later today or tomorrow. We'll also take the slide deck and it will be up on uh, SlideShare and we'll make that link to you as avail available as well. Um, there are, there's a section down at the bottom that says question and answers. So feel free to type your questions in there and I'll be kind of managing those. Uh, we'll try to get to them if we can and it's appropriate during the uh, presentation. Some of them we may save and sometimes we find we've got a question that we really can't answer online. In that case, we'll get back to you. Uh, uh, afterwards. There's also the chat, chat option. I see we've got a couple more chats in there, so feel free to use that to communicate with us, uh, the panelists, or you, you actually can be seen by everybody. Uh, the last thing is, is that you will get a, a post-webinar survey later today, and we just like to have your feedback on how we did so that we can get better. Uh, and of course, if you've got uh, audio or video issues, we want to hear about that. You can let us know in chat. And so with that, Mike, we're starting with you, right? Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm Mike Heisey, you know, with CareMerge. And Steve, can you go to the 
the next slide and give you a quick overview uh, of CareMerge. So we are a healthcare technology company launched in 2012, and we are quickly approaching our seventh year in the uh, senior housing industry. We have over 390 client locations all over the United States. Uh, we were started with strong investment um, with uh, some of the best and brightest in the senior living community and have a great support system. And we're headquartered in Chicago, uh, right in the middle of the country, and our team is, is always out uh, from coast to coast, meeting with clients and continually in, improving processes. Great. And I would add they have a great office if you ever get a chance to visit. It's a, it's a pretty cool office. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Um, so kind of want to talk about the evolution of communication. So, um, you know, when, when we go back to the basics, you think about phone calls and, and mail with, you know, residents, resident families, um, the delay messages can get lost. You know, think about the time that it would take to take a photo, develop it, put it in the mail, send it out. Um, you know, then we come upon the age of, of email. Um, and, and there's, you know, pluses and minuses to this. So your email inbox can get filled up. You can overlook messages. You take a picture on your phone and you have to transfer it or email it yourself to the computer and, and then send an email to family members. And this could take time away from actually spending time with residents. So now we're in the, the age of apps, right? There's almost an app for everything. And you have the ability to communicate real time send photos, videos, documents, you know, directly between staff and family members. And that, that really creates um, this on-demand communication and, and peace of mind for family members when they can see in real time, how is their loved one doing? And now in the next step, which, which everyone in the industry is just getting their feet wet with, is, is voice technology. So now how apps can work very well for staff and family members, um, we have, we have loved ones in the active aging community that maybe don't want to use a computer or a phone or are vision impaired and can't, can't see the screen. And we have all these innovations coming out in voice technology that enable communication with family members, with staff, you know, work orders and, and everything in between. So the evolution of communication has given great opportunity to create better bonds with your residents and your family members. So just to give an overview of, of, of Care Merge, you know, part of our business is engagement. So we have an engagement platform on web and mobile for staff, and it goes everything from you know, patient records to taking attendance and messaging family members. We do have an iOS uh, and Android app for family members that can see a resident's calendar, communicate with staff, um, you know, and just check on appointments just to see a status, how their loved one's doing, and then community engagement. And this is where um, kind of the forefront of technology comes in. Besides a desktop and mobile version, we're also working on voice technology with residents can, that can check events in their area, um, put in work orders, and, and a lot of other things in the way. So uh, this is kind of how Care Merge connects the, the dots of communication. And we are also looking forward to, uh, you know, the conversation of, of how this communication with family can um, increase engagement. Terrific. So um, on our end, I just kind of like the closing statement, want to drive why communication is important. So um, within our ecosystem, we've seen communication can lead to referrals of the community. So I'm a family member, I'm getting great update, uh, updates from staff, and then I go and I'm on Facebook, I'm on social media, I'm talking about how, um, how great I feel that someone is taking care of my uh, loved one. There are, there are groups that people are in that communicate through word of mouth as some of the challenges and benefits of having you know, a loved one in supportive living. So the better communication usually leads to great referrals, whether that's word of mouth or through social media. Um, we also use an MPS system, which is Net Promoter Score. So in real time, we can see feedback and um, you know what, what, what drives uh, people uh, to our app. You know, is are are they telling us these, these are the these are the great things that are happening? Um, these are some some things that can be improved upon. And we are in an agile technology environment and always improving our product. 
And all this uh, starts with no matter what the communication is, if you see a family member in person for the first time, if it's the first email or message that you send to them, it's all about setting expectations. And this creates better relationships from the start. And with that, I will turn it over to Rebecca. Thank you so much, Mike. Could you go to the next slide, please? Uh -huh. And let's go one more. My, my goal today is to provide kind of an overview of what uh, a robust expectations management program can look like as part of a larger expectation, uh, as part of a larger risk management component of your community. And also to discuss some of the defense strategies we used and risk management um, techniques that we use is, uh, it, that includes expectations management. And for a fuller understanding of that aspect of defense strategies and risk mitigation and litigation, I kind of I wanted to share with you a little bit of my experience and what we're seeing in the industry as to as to some of the claims in uh, senior housing and particularly in um, assisted care living facilities and assisted living. Uh, and so you can get a, a, a kind of a larger appreciation of how the importance of expectations management in, in your risk management program as well as uh, how it can be a, a litigation risk mitigator. So. The, one of the questions that I'm often asked is why is senior housing and specifically why is assisted living a target in the industry for plaintiff's attorneys? And a few of these slides uh, we're going to be going through will be just a, a brief overview. So back when I started practicing in the 1990s, we were really just seeing lawsuits develop around the skilled, uh, skilled care model and not in assisted living. But assisted living now is kind of the long-term care option of choice for aging in place, for resident choices, for dignity, and for privacy issues. And so the focus on skilled facilities has shifted toward assisted living because we are more and more, because of um, the level of independence and also with the creation of continued care communities, we are seeing this as kind of a, a, a more expanded model that the plaintiff's attorneys are focusing on. And then the next slide. And also, we're seeing larger corporate operators, similar to the skilled facilities in the 90s, larger corporate op uh, uh, operators, higher acuity levels for our community members. We're seeing community members who are uh, on multitudes, uh, have a multiple uh, medications, who have multiple comorbid conditions, which is much different than it used to be over the past, let's say, 15 or 20 years. So we're seeing, again, kind of a skilled care um, model being applied to assisted living where the plaintiff's attorney's view is uh, and perspective is. So can you talk a little bit more about the promises they can't keep that you got there? Or yeah, and I think when we're, we'll talk about that more in the, okay. um, on the marketing side of it, but you know, the, the, uh, in, in the assisted living forms, just in senior housing, what we're finding on the perspective that the plaintiff's attorneys advance is that you know where the the community management and the care providers are making promises such as uh, higher levels of staffing for care, 24-hour care, uh, promising to uh, rehabilitate your loved one, uh, and 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 claims that uh, essentially the care being provided in the in the community is going to surpass what standards uh, what standards are. And an expectations management program, which we'll discuss in a couple of minutes, Steve, really addresses that. Like, what are the, what are, how have the family members, the residents and their family members and their circle defined the expectations for um, the residential care community? And, and how can we redefine those expectations with the families so that we can better manage them? Terrific. And also, the long-term care, the understanding that plaintiff's attorneys have in long-term care is very, uh, is very uh, specific. Uh, there is now industry data, not only in the skilled area, uh, but industry data now with surveys for um, regulations for assisted living. We're getting more and more information available to the public and available to um, plaintiff's attorneys so that they have some more information that they're using uh, against our industry. And the damages are more severe in assisted living because you uh, customarily have residents who are more mobile, who have 
uh, uh, longer life expectancy than you do in skilled if there is a fall leading to immobility, for example, or if there is a development of a pressure sore or some other condition that has a larger impact on damages than it would necessarily in the, in the skilled setting. Um, again, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but the assisted living kind of, of the, in, the, in, in its current form is very similar to what the skilled facilities, kind of uh, the model in the early 1990s. For many years, assisted livings were not, facilities were not involved in, in, uh, in litigation, so it was an untouched industry. And again, resident needs are higher. We're seeing more, um, we're seeing, you know, end of life and end of life care at the site of assisted living where many years ago that was at the, in the skilled setting. So all of these factors contribute to an increased litigation risk for, uh, for, um, for assisted living. So again, I'll run through this quite quickly, but the theories of law, and the importance of this is, is these theories of liability that we see in lawsuits against assisted living are areas where we want to address in expectations management. And so there is an intersection between these theories and how we are fully disclosing information during the admissions process and during the whole continuum of care to address these potential risk issues. You see theories of common law negligence, there was a duty, there was a breach of that duty by the care providers, and then there were damages that resulted from them. You see claims of wrongful death, we now see violations of Consumer Protection Act, breach of contract, for example, the admissions agreement, violations of residence rights, uh, focusing on staff and, and administration claims, negligent hiring and retention of staff, and then violation of state regulations. Um, so those are some of the theories that we see in, um, in, in assisted living lawsuits. And these are the types of claims. So these are the types of of injuries and certain um, particular characteristics of claims, falls, um, physical and uh, physical abuse um, uh, and mental abuse, corporate negligence, for example, corporations making decisions about budgets that may impact staffing or impact supplies that have a negative impact on care, elopement and wandering, changes in condition, for example, uh, uh, residents who are not properly transferred when a community can no longer provide for the needs of the residents, so uh, improper placement and then also uh, uh, improper transfer. Failure to supervise the resident um, is another one of the common claims that we see. And there are a few more here, Steve, I think on the next slide. Uh, inconsistent, incomplete, or erroneous information contained in records. Uh, improper placement of residents in res during the residence admission, and we've discussed that. Medication administration errors, violation of facility policies and procedures, uh, which again, these are all the same types of claims that we are um, also defending in skilled uh, in this uh, skilled arena. Wound issues and the development and progression of wound care, and then failure to timely transfer or discharge and failure to maintain ongoing assessments of residents and their care plans. So those are the common claims that we're seeing. So the question is, how does a expectations management, kind of what are the components of an expectations management program? Um, why have one and, uh, and what are the strengths of it? So in discussing an expectations management program, it's more than just understanding the expectations of your family, and the members in your community, and then trying to redefine and manage those. It's really a, 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 a program that's designed for the continuum of care throughout a resident's uh, stay in our communities. And the key to it is, is to set those real is expectations on admission. Uh, and even before admission, uh, meetings with the families before admission, understanding what their expectations have been, if they are being admitted from home, or if they are being admitted from an acute care setting. Uh, so the, the first bullet point here on maximizing disclosures and consents in applications forms, in application forms, resident admission agreements, et cetera. So when we're uh, working with our families to admit them, we have a multitude of different uh, forms. We have a multitude of different disclosures. And it's gonna be important, as we'll see later in, the, in, the, in my, my portion of the presentation, 
how the disclosure of various risks that occur, the differences in living at home, for example, and, and living in a, in a community, having a full disclosure in the various forms uh, that your community uses, and the the, the you know the the uh, the real um, interesting part of this is that an expectations management program can really be individualized for your communities. And for example, working with Care Merge and their application, our hope is is that we can also incorporate an expectations management program into the application, so we can continually communicate with the community members, with their families about expectations because they also change. So, uh, and they change as trajectories of illnesses progress, as um, aging in place takes part, as some family members come in and some family members may no longer be involved. So there's a lot of changes in expectations that we want to manage. And then understanding that it's the resident, uh, the member of your community, their legal representative or the responsible party that defines ex expectations. So we have a, a, a responsibility to really understand the history of not just the resident, but the resident's family, and then work to kind of redefine those expectations so that the family uh, and the resident really understand what it is we're trying to do and collaborate in doing to make sure that the resident stays safe, that we can you know, uh, optimize care uh, and um, and meet the needs of the resident and, it, and meet expectations that are realistic. Thank you, Steve. So these are some high risk issues that I um, that I'm identifying here that could be included in this disclosure and uh, in disclosures during the course of the admissions. For example, dementia and understanding that there are um, hazards that could be in the community that are different hazards than could be in your home. Uh, that wandering could result in falls, that there's weight loss, that there might be dehydration, skin breakdown, that medication management is different when you are, um, uh, that there are different protocols in place when you're me managing medication for uh, a group of individuals in a community versus one individual. Uh, so understanding, uh, you know, the, the risks involved with dementia and, and getting the, having the family, understanding their expectations around it, and then managing those and redefining those. Motorized carts, private duty aids, alcohol, smoking, firearms, those are other risk areas that we like to discuss on admission and during the course of the care in order to understand the expectations and what our expectations are for the families and the residents uh, in those areas. Understanding and explaining staffing levels, patterns, and service limitations that were not res they were not a 24-hour care, for example. Uh, we're not a facility that keeps locks on our doors. Whatever the, the limitations might be uh, and the different um, staffing levels and staffing patterns. Some regulations state by state are different in terms of what staffing patterns need to be, and all that information should be disclosed to the families as part of setting realistic expectations. Uh, and, and, and communicating with the family, and this goes back to Mike's uh, excellent presentation about really kind of the history of communication and the importance of continued communication is, you know, the loss of function and the decline and the impact that uh, occurs to the resident and the family and disclosing that on the front end, getting an agreed understanding uh, and, and, and including the family uh, in the uh, in the in the care, so that if there is, for example, a change in condition, that they understand how to identify it and who to go and speak to, so we can continue to manage those expectations. Uh, understanding that residents have the right and can refuse to accept care, they can refuse to accept nutrition, they can ex refuse to accept um, medication, and then including this information in written disclosures and disclaimers within the resident admission agreement. So those are kind of the highlights on the high risk issues that we would like to see in writing as part of a expectations management program. Um, and then, you know, the, it, it, again, this is a bit of an, an expansion, you know, understanding that in the, that there's a balance of risks um, and there's a quality of life and an independence that our residents um, want and that our families want for them, but the environment in assisted living cannot eliminate all the risks. We can seek to minimize the risks while maximizing quality of care, but we can't necessarily just eliminate all the risks in a community. 
um, not providing one-on-one -on -one care we discussed uh, and not being a full security lockdown environment and making sure that family members understand the level of security. And then understanding the employment of management systems and um, we can make rec recommendations and we can help implement interventions for falls, for example, but we can't institute 100% fall prevention and it's nearly impossible, well, it is impossible. So getting, uh, you know, creating a, a common understanding with the family is going to be important on these high risk issues. So the, uh, you know, another part of the expectations management program, and Kim, you might be able to address this as well, is just, you know, you've got, you know, your admissions process, but then you have your marketing and your public information. Uh, Steve, this kind of goes to your point in making promises that we can't keep. One of the things that I do for our clients is I make sure we're monitoring the content on their websites, we're monitoring all the content in their, um, in their publications and in the information they're making known to the public. And now the public has access to so much information that it's more important than ever to make sure that the information you're disseminating about your community is information that's accurate about, for example, acuity, level of the patients, uh, community education and involvement and continuing to update the community with accurate information about your, uh, about your facility and what the, service and the services that it provides. Um, obtaining satisfaction surveys from your referral sources is going to be very, very important to understand if you are meeting their expectations as a referral source, but just making sure that on the marketing and public information, you're keeping very updated on um, on what you're disseminating. And then also tracking, for example, if you have a Facebook or if you have other social media, what people are posting on their social media. Some communities have uh, family portals and making sure we're, um, we're understanding the information we're getting. And, and, um, and again, there's not just the expectations of the family, but expectations of the community as well. So in the admissions process, just briefly, if you were going to institute an expectations management program, my recommendation is to start here in the admissions process. Um, understanding the pre-admission history of a resident, where they came from, who their family is, are they coming from an acute care setting, what their conditions are, and then what the expectations are uh, uh, with the family. I've been in many cases where the family had an expectation that their loved one would ultimately come home while their pre-admission clinical history tells a completely different story. Um, and then uh, during the admission process, incorporating expectations management into the process itself. The process itself is a very emotional process uh, for so many who are admitting their loved ones to, um, to a new community and who are changing the lifestyles of really everyone involved in the family ecosystem. So understanding that, that process and gathering as much information as you can during the process about who the family is. And again, this kind of goes into the family dynamics and understanding how they arrived at the process. All this information is going to be critical to understand their expectations, spoken and unspoken, disclosed and undisclosed, so we can better define them and, uh, and, and try and meet those expectations. Understanding clearly the resident's diagnosis so that we can um, come to an understanding about the trajectory of those illnesses. Residents with dementia, we know, and Alzheimer's can progress to the point of losing appetites and their impacts and nutrition issues and it impacts uh, the physical condition of the resident. Understanding those diagnoses clearly and explaining them to the family. And then understanding what the advanced directives are because those are the advanced directives are a real insight into family expectations. Um, do not resuscitate versus full codes kind of gives you an insight into where the family uh, may be putting their expectations in terms of uh, the, uh, the end of life and end of life care and expectations of their loved one. And then during the admissions process, these are some, um, some tools that you can use. We have videos and we have an admission agreement that includes expectations management language um, which I can share with you um, after the program, Steve, we can get together and I can offer some of that information to, to folks who are attending and who, are, who would like it, um, kind of what an expectations management uh, admissions agreement incorporating the admissions agreement might look like. You can show a video to the family about these various areas of risk and get their understanding and have them execute a disclaimer 
about limitations, for example, a service disclaimer, so they understand what the community, they've represented to us that they understand what the limitations are and what the expectations are. Uh, during the admissions process, involving as many family members as possible, and then during the course of the care, even after the admissions process, to make sure family stays involved and accountable also for their loved one. Um, identifying staffing levels, again, uh, during the admissions process, being very clear about staffing levels, different staffing patterns, uh, what the regulations require for staffing, someone's expectations about you know having caregivers on the floor all the time is different than what we actually are required to do or what the level of care is needed in the in the community based on what the acuity is of the residents. And then these common care issues, again, to address these on the front end, and weight loss that occurs in the senior housing communities, falls or no restraint facilities, skin breakdown, pain management, these common clinical issues that arise that have attendant risks associated with them and, and, and coming to common understanding with families and with the residents about these so we can manage those expectations, set those expectations realistically, and then manage those. So Rebecca, I've got a uh, sort of a, maybe this is even a weird question, but you know, we see in, in more and more in the police departments, they're using body cams and recorders to record interactions. Do you have any thoughts about whether it would make sense to record either with video or audio sort of the admission process because there's a lot of talking that goes on that has the potential to either, I suppose, either help or hurt uh, if you ever had a litigation problem? Anybody? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's a, there are some strengths to that and then some weaknesses. I think, you know, in, the, in this case of full disclosure, I don't think we can do that without disclosing, of course, to the family that we're recording right. them, which then I think puts kind of a chilling effect on the process in some ways, um, which I, I, I think could be helpful to us if we're saying what we want to say and we're, we are disclosing the information we want to close. But I think that it might create already a, what we want to do is create an environment of trust. And what we want to do is create an environment where we start to cultivate a relationship with the resident and the family, particularly because it's such an emotional time. Um, now, on the standpoint of is it a good idea, it probably is always a good idea to, you know, make sure that the good things that we're doing are recorded so we can refer to them later. Uh, however, I think with a robust expectations management program in writing, I think we can accomplish uh, kind of the same, the, same, uh, the same goals. If you've got, for example, we have a video and we can design videos, we design videos for our clients that are specific to their communities, but we can put this information ourselves in a video, invite the family to watch it and have them sign that they watched it and they understand, which kind of is a, is a, a more passive way of maybe doing the same thing as opposed to um, inviting them to have to, you know, make verbal representations or something like that. I think it might have a, 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 a um, uh, you know, a, an effect on our initial relationship with them. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. And one, I have one more question that came in from from the audience, and it, it it reads like this: If a family member shared a DNA, DNR, refusal to eat, etc., as a as a coda cell, but wants to keep it private, how does how does the adult child deal with this relative to family regulations? And so I did actually ask for a little bit of clarification on that, and I think what the question is, and the I assume that you're listening, and so if I got so got it right, maybe you can come into either chat or add to it. But the question would be is if a family member signed up but didn't actually want the facility to know that they had signed a DNR or some sort of a restraint of of care type document, um, how would you deal with that? So just so I, and I just want to make sure I understand, and I probably should make a disclaimer that I can't give any legal advice, right? Right, that's right. <laughs> but y'all can call me later, um, and I, you know, so I can get some more information. However, as I understand it, this resident's family member would be the person who's legally authorized, for example, to execute a DNR for the resident. We'd assume that first that this is a legal document in a you know, a, an unenforceable DNR signed by the appropriate a person with authority, with the power to do that and make healthcare decisions. Assuming that, and 
that there is a do not resuscitate order and that there are end of life care orders, you know, my recommendation is, is that again, this goes to full disclosure because if in fact you have a do not resuscitate and let's say your loved one is involved in an incident, let's say they have a, uh, they uh, have some kind of a, a cardiovascular event, uh, they have a heart attack, they have some other event that is um, that needs you know that where resuscitation efforts under a full code would be uh, in place, then there can be some liability on the facility for resuscitating a resident whose wishes are actually to not be resuscitated. So from the community standpoint, making sure like our checklist, for example, in the admissions is is there a DNR? If there's not a DNR, we have a DNR completed right then and there either by the resident if they're competent or by the legally authorized person. But we, but we, if there is a DNR and we're unaware of it, um, I guess is that, is, does that answer the question? Yeah, I mean, I, to me, I think the question really is, is if there's a DNR or if a family has a DNR, uh, do they a, have a, a right to not disclose that to the community? And what, what are the implications for the community? So here's, here's how the conversation would go. You know, as part of our admissions process, we're required to know under the regulations what the end of life care plan is because we need to have a, a, you know, they need to have a plan for, 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 um, for their end of life, a living will or uh, in whatever your, your jurisdiction is, there needs to be that uh, in place. So when the family says, well, we have one, but we don't want to give it to you. We want to withhold that from you. We don't want you to know what the end of life, you know, the decisions for our family member were. Um, we would have to document that. Frankly, to me, that raises a red flag and I would insist on it or I wouldn't admit the resident. I think that creates such a great risk for the community to not know what the resuscitation plans are, if they're to be given antibiotics, if they're to be given fluids, if they're to be given a feeding tube, I mean, that's all contained in that, in what you're describing in, a, in essentially a living will. And without that, um, you know, and again, you gotta check your state regulations, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree to admit a resident if they, were, if they were confirming to me that they were withholding that document. Okay, perfect. I appreciate that. I think that, yeah. that we hit it. So yeah, and if there's more on that, again, you know, you've guys got my contact information. Just I, you know, this is my passion, so I'd answer these questions all day. But uh, fortunately, you get to hear from Kim here in a second. The the admissions process. This is just my last slide here. That as I suggested, it continues on an expectations management program to discuss end of life issues, refusal of services, making sure expectations are reasonable, and to discuss arbitration. These are some ancillary, um, um, uh, yet very, very important issues that need to come up when, dis when discussing expectations, but that can also be, uh, be uh, introduced into the conversation um, later in the process. Perfect, thank you thank very much. Thank you, Steve. And um, I will be talking about the best practices for family engagement and how we really roll this out at Garden Management Solution Communities. We make sure that we are um, talking about uh, what Care Merge is to our families, letting them know how they can be connected to our community via Care Merge, that um, everything to do with Care Merge. Um, is online, so they are using their laptops, their smartphones, their desktop computers. Um, it's HIPAA compliant, so that will also give them a little peace of mind that um, anything that's going back and forth between the community and um, our, our residents' families through Care Merge will be um, kept safe and secure. And how we start this um, really is our implementation process. So our next slide, um, we'll talk about uh, training our staff on who, want, who needs to know about Care Merge. In our communities, all of our staff need to know about Care Merge. We start with our management staff, making sure that they are, um, are, are really trained in speaking with our families about Care Merge. 
Um, our staff, management staff are on duty for weekends and holidays. So when we have family tours that come in, we like to make sure we're able to talk about Care Merge during the tour time. Our frontline staff also work with our residents and families. They see them sometimes day to day. So we make sure that they understand what Care Merge family engagement is and what the benefits of that service is to our family members. Um, and then also residents, we want to make sure that they understand that this is another communication tool that we use to stay connected with their families and to continue to provide the best care possible for them. And the next slide, um, what we like to tell our families is that um, they can be connected to their residents by sending messages and photos that our staff will print and deliver for them. Um, our staff also will connect to them by sending messages and photos to them of their resident while they're engaged in life in our community. Families also have access to the key care locations for their resident, such as a physician appointment, um, any, upcom any phys physician information as far as contact numbers, addresses and things like that. We also keep them connected to that activity calendar. Families are able to log into Care Merge um, and see what activities are scheduled for the day. This was helpful in planning their next trip to the community. Whether they know it's a favorite activity of their loved one that maybe they'll wait an hour and come afterwards, or maybe it's an activity they'd like to join in with their loved one and they'll make a point to come at that, ta at that time and enjoy it with them. They also have real-time notifications of their resident activity participations. So when our activity director goes into Care Merge and logs in the attendance for the activities, that family member will get a notification that their loved one attended that activity. That's a great peace of mind for them to know that their loved one is involved in life in the community. It also helps them when they come in for a visit gives them um, a subject to talk about with their loved one. If their loved one has some memory loss, sometimes they don't remember that they've been involved in life in the community and activities. And so this kind of gives a little bit of information to the family ahead of time to know that they were and to be able to talk about that with their loved one. We also stay connected with our families um, via the NPS survey. They have the ability to participate in that survey um, every 60 days when they log into their Care Merge account. And that gives us some great uh, feedback on the services that we're offering. We also keep them connected. Um, it's a digital aid, so we are able to use Care Merge to upload our party invitations, our flyers, any newsletters, uh, mem menus, or anything else that we want our families to know right through that family announcement portal. And our next slide we'll um, talk a little bit about that implementation process. So what we do again is that we talk about it right at tour. Families and residents of our assisted living will come in for a tour of our community and we'll talk about that with our families and let them know about those connections and how um, having Care Merge as an amenity will keep them connected to their loved one and life in the community. We also um, will make sure that the authorization form is signed um, at the time that they're coming in to sign their lease for their new apartment. And so our staff members will have them sign the authorization form for Care Merge at that point of lease signing. And then our um, resident services coordinator um, or activity director, they will send the invitation to our family members right on the computer, let them know that we have the authorization sign form, um, form signed, we are ready to get them into the um, family uh, engagement portal. So we will send that invitation. Family members will then accept it and we'll get notification that the family members accepted the link and they set up their profile. And then um, we at Gardens will also send a welcome picture. And one of um, the fun things that we do for our residents when they admit is that we have um, a ribbon cutting at their apartment door and we always take a picture of the ribbon cutting. And so that's that first picture that we'll send to families welcoming them to the Care Emerge and Garden family. And with our next slide, this again talks about um, the purpose for families that I spoke about earlier, being connected to the community, giving them peace of mind, um, knowing that their loved one is involved in the activities, being able to see the activities, being able to get notifications of those activities they attended, sending and receiving emails and pictures, um, connecting to the administrator um, with that NPS survey. The results go to our administrators. 
So those are um, the, the key staff to get those results, um, to be able to see them right away and to act upon um, any results that come across the screen. And then also the purpose for staff is we want to keep our staff more engaged in those meaningful conversations with our families. Um, and in, in keeping them engaged, that really demonstrates how our programs will add joy, purpose, and meaning to the lives of our residents. We also have um, wellness profile and attendance logs that are in the service plan that family members are able to um, have access to, to also um, be able to see how their loved one is involved in life in the community. And this also helps to increase our satisfaction with our families and our referrals. And this is the authorization form that I spoke about that we have families sign at the time of our lease signing. And um, we are able to take this form, give it to the activity director after the lease signing, then they'll go into the computer and invite the family members. And you'll notice there's several lines on there. Uh, there is not a limit to how many family members can be signed up for each resident. As long as they have their own unique email address to stay HIPAA compliant with the link, we're able to have um, many, many family members signed up for that loved one. And on the next slide, we have the fold-out pocket brochure. And this is, um, this is a mock-up of what the brochure looks like. It actually folds into the size of a cell phone. And at the time of lease signing, when families sign that authorization form, we also give them this fold-out pocket brochure for their pocket. That way, it is another reminder for them um, to check their email when they get back home, that they're going to have that email invitation from their friends at CareMerge and our community, inviting them to sign up and get their profile started with, um, with our community. The NPS survey that I spoke about earlier, uh, this is a little information about that survey. The net promoter score is um, one question that's asked of those authorized contacts. And the question is, how likely are you to recommend the community to your friends and or colleagues? They're able to rate us from zero to 10. They can also add a narrative to that. Um, we ask that the survey comes on every 60 days. Um, a family member, once they take it, it would not pre-populate again for 60 days. They are able to skip it if they don't have time at the moment they pull, uh, really log into CareMerge. And if they opt to skip it, then it will come back the next time they log in. And if they opt to skip it again, then it wouldn't come back for 60 days. We want their information and feedback, but we also don't want to um, bother them often every time they sign in. So that's why we put it on as a 60-day pre-population. The sense that feedback is really important for our, our, our community. Yes, Steve. Yeah, can I ask you a couple questions here? So um, you've been doing this for a while, and can you give us any feedback in terms of just kind of what you've learned in this process, and have you actually seen an increase, an improvement in your net promoter score because you've been doing this? We have. We have seen an increase also in our um, number of families signing up for Care Merge because we changed the, um, the process in which we spoke about care merch to our families and residents. So we really looked at um, the process of how we rolled it out, and that is where we tweaked it into talking about it at tour time and um, making sure that we are signing the proper paperwork during the lease when our families are there with our residents. Um, a lot of times our seniors do not know the email addresses of their family members. And so in, our, in looking at the process where we were asking residents, we knew we needed to change it and ask family members because they have their email addresses. So that really saw our, our numbers increase from our family engagement um, pretty largely to how many people are signing up and being more engaged in our communities. We, we've, we looked at that a couple years ago and thought, I think we're asking the wrong, wrong people. So we really changed it to that tour with the families at least signing. And then for the NPS survey, we are um, seeing our scores come in and, and they have improved. What I like about that is that um, we get to see those surveys more often than what Garden does with their annual surveys for families and residents. So we're giving them um, more opportunities to 
give us feedback. Um, and then that's going right to our administrator who families usually want. They want the administrator to know, hey, I have a compliment or hey, I have a quick concern. That's the person they want to go to. So knowing that it's going right to that administrator's desk is, is a peace of mind for our, uh, our family members. And that has helped us a lot in our scores as well. So if I were a family member and I had the, um, the Care Merge uh, family app or had access to the portal, how often am I going to sort of typically get updates? You will get updates um, every time the activity director puts in an, an attendance for an activity. There's going to be a notification that, hey, your loved one attended maybe five activities that day or four that day. So there'll be four or five um, notifications for every activity that went on. And then anytime the activity director will um, send a message or a photo to the family member, there'll be something there. Okay, there's terrific. Always, yeah, and there's always um, contact in the calendar. It's always there. They're able to look at that at any time. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so the rest of this really just talks about the scores. The zero to six are detractors and someone who wasn't highly recommend, um, uh, highly likely to recommend us. Seven to eights are the passive responders and um, they're kind of the middle of the road, um, not sure one way or the other. And nine to 10, those are our promoters. They're highly likely to recommend us to their friends and colleagues. And so when those scores come in, we like to follow up with them to refer them to marketing and find out out if they'll do a Google review for us, a testimonial or something like that. Okay, perfect. And the next slide will um, talk about that data collection. Where do we find that? This just gives you a quick tutorial when you go into Care Merge, how to find that report um, on the back side of it. So as, um, as a company, right. we're looking at that report, that's where we would go to find our survey results. Great. Um, questions, uh, comments. Um, well, actually, a couple couple of great um, questions. So, how did how does how does using Care Merge impact the um, uh, the attendance at, uh, at activities? Are you finding that it increases activities or something else, or ch not changing? I have seen uh, a couple different things. It's kind of funny that you asked that, Steve. Um, I have had activity directors tell me, you know, um, our resident, she told me that she definitely didn't want to miss bingo today, even though she was a little tired because her daughter said, I saw it on the calendar. It's one of your favorites. And I noticed you didn't go last, last week, mom. So I really want you to go. So I thought that was kind of interesting that the family um, kind of used that a little bit as a motivator that, you know, we really want you to be involved and we see if you are or if you aren't. And um, so I thought that was quite interesting that they said that. And then the, the next question I have from uh, the audience is this, are you, are, is there any communication about food and meals about both what's available and what was actually served? And I guess maybe even, is there anything that, that, that I would add to it is, is there any, uh, do you communicate information about how well a resident is eating, or I guess mostly a concern would be a not eating? Um, well, through Care Merge, we have, um, I spoke about the engagement part, which is activities, recreation, engagement, and life in the community. There are also um, the, the clinical side to that, and um, the directors of nursing in our garden communities have access to Care Merge and family engagement as well. So they are able to field questions and answers from families. And um, if families have a question or concern, they I have seen the emails that will go to them um, asking about it. And then the, the director of nursing will usually pick up the phone and call the families and talk with them um, about any concern that they may have. So that's one way um, that we can, can use the clinical side to kind of help with that. And also, um, we do have several communities that put their menus they um, write in Care Merge. So what they do is their, men, their weekly menus, they send them out as a document and family announcement so families can see what the menus are for the week. Great. So another question for you is, can Care Merge be used for staff members to communicate to each other or where that communication wouldn't be visible to family members? And so this would be just sort of, you know, 
I need some help with this, or are you having a problem with Mr. Smith today? Kinds of things that wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't want family to see, um, but would make it easy to communicate with other staff members in the community. Well, we do have on the clinical side, there are um, places for notes for the medical notes um, and charting for nurses. And then um, if there are, if there are, there's anything uh, more, any verbal, I'm having trouble here or there, that's not part of the clinical chart, and that wouldn't be considered part of the clinical chart, yep. then our nursing staff would just communicate with each other um, outside of that. The clinical part is really assessments, clinical information of the resident. Okay, and the, the, this is actually a great question. So how are you actually using Alexa or other voice technologies? Um, and this may be a care merge question. Yeah, than, I was just uh, going to say, I think that's a care merge question. Than, uh, for you? Yes. Yeah, so um, that is a great question. So right now we're focused on voice technology in, um, in resident engagement. So I could say, you know, Alexa, what's on the schedule for today? And Alexa will tell me all the events going on in my community. Um, we're working on uh, integration for work order. So Alexa, my cabinet's broken, submit a work order. And, and being able to, to do these things uh, with, with the power of voice technology. Uh, even things as simple as Alexa is the mail-in, right? So I don't wanna go all the way down to the front desk or the mailbox if the mail's not in yet and I can get an, an alert. And, and all the other you know, features of Alexa compared with Care Merge, which is set a reminder so I take my medication at five o'clock or how's the weather? Uh, Alexa, play music, and, and we've seen the, the, the combination of, you know, our specific, um, our specific communication platform combined <laughs> with uh, general, of, uh, general what Alexa does is, is, a, is a great, um, great combination. Yeah, and the other comment was that Alexa is a great, great source for uh, people who have vision problems, so... Uh, so it, it, another question is, is there a way to manage all these voice assistant devices using an inter enterprise dashboard or does it have to be done individually? Um, so yes, we do have, uh, well, it can actually be done both ways. You could manage each one individually or you can use our enterprise dashboard and uh, I wouldn't even see, you could set them all, you could set maybe some things in IL, different things in, in AL, you could configure them in, in groups, whatever way you like. Great, and a couple more questions. Do Does every resident get a DOT or, um, uh, um, or how, how, how do you propagate the, the voice in buildings? And so, I know it's gonna vary a lot from community to community or from enterprise or organization to organization, so. And, and, and it does. So there are some communities that have Alexa in all their community rooms or, or throughout, um, you know, throughout the, the community areas, which are all public, and residents can and ask on the go. And there's other ones that have either applied, applied to grants or allocated funding to have Echo Dots in all of the rooms. It just depends on the, the budget and what the community wants to do. Great. And can, is Care Merge, does it have an application for home use for families to interact with individual elders at home? Not, not yet. Okay. Great. And is the uh, Alexa information uh, a flow HIPAA compliant? So currently there's no HIPAA information that's being shared. You know, events okay. that are happening in the community and if the mail's in and uh, work orders, uh, dining menus, all, the, all this information is not HIPAA compliant, um, but that is, the, that is the future though. Um, and there, there's conversations being had in that arena. Cool, great. Uh, okay, one more question and then we're gonna call it quits. Uh, we'd be glad to do this offline, but how difficult was it for caregiver staff to learn the care merge system? How much time doing training? Um. I can answer that if you like. I spend about two hours um, at onboarding of new, of new uh, employees, going over uh, the different aspects of Care Merge, how to put in your activity calendar, how to edit events, how to pre-populate them. So if you have bingo every Friday at two o'clock, you only have to type it once and it'll pre-populate for every Friday at two o'clock until you tell it not to. Um, so about two hours is what I spend in training them on how to do that, how to download it, how to print it out, um, how to put in your attendance. 
um, how to find your NPS survey. I feel it's very user friendly and I have staff um, who have been in the field for a long time and I have brand new staff who haven't been in the field for very long and um, I don't have too many questions or problems with it. They're able to um, really navigate it well. Um, and I think the beauty of Care Merge from a corporate point of view is that if I have a staff member who's stuck or I need to do a training, I can log on um, remotely from my computer and see what they're seeing on their screen and walk them through any tasks. And that's really helpful. Cool, great. So with that, we're actually over time and we're right at 11 o'clock. And so I wanna thank each of the panelists for um, your conversation. Uh, Mike, or Kim, Rebecca, any one last word before we finish up? Really informative. I'm looking forward to introducing Care Merge to a lot of my clients. Appreciate that, Kim, Mike, Steve. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for attending and you'll get some emails with links to the uh, webinar and a survey. And again, we'd really appreciate it if you take the survey uh, and, uh, and that will help us improve on the next webinar we're doing. So have a great rest of your day and a great week and thank you very much.